Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, before I do anything else, I want to remind everybody, uh, those of you that have these in your pocket, please silence your cell phone. Uh, my name is Craig Jackson. I'm the co-director for this year's Sega National Colloquium, along with my colleague, Sean McCulloch, in the back. Uh, the theme of this year's SNC is data in our lives. Today, many different people and organizations are embracing the modern abundance of data to better market products, to tell richer stories, and to answer questions about ourselves, our society, and our world. But there are also legitimate and growing concerns related to the inappropriate use of data. Uh, the collection of data has numerous privacy, legal, and ethical concerns. Data can also be misused, misunderstood, or badly analyzed. This year's colloquium brings together internationally recognized artists, writers, activists, professionals, and scholars from diverse fields to encourage broad conversation on these and other aspects of the growing importance of data in our lives. Uh, to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, please welcome Paul Costu from the Department of Journalism. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, and I've had an opportunity to meet with uh, Anna, and it's not Anna, it's Anna, I've been reminded, uh, uh, Flag, Flag, not Flog, yeah, okay, uh, throughout the day, and so I think you'll find her presentation interesting and enlightening. Anna is an award-winning data journalist and interactive reporter for the Marshall Product Project, a nonprofit news organization focusing on the American criminal justice system. She has covered NSA surveillance, campaign finance, military spending, and the environment for news organizations such as Al Jazeera, ProPublica, and the Center for Responsive Politics. Her story about smart fur, or also called Cuddlebot, was featured on the cover of the New York Times Magazine's innovation issue. It's appropriate that Anna is here because Ohio was one of the first, Ohio Wesleyan was one of the first universities, big or small, in the country to offer computer assisted reporting as part of its journalism program more than 20 years ago. Anna is, uh, studied applied math at the University of Toronto. Now, this is unusual for a journalist because most of my majors typically hate math. But Anna also has a master's degree from the University of British Columbia in human computer interaction. She, however, is not a Canadian. She was born in India and grew up in the United States. And she says she uh, was deciding between the University of Toronto and NYU for her under undergraduate education, and Toronto won out because it was way less expensive, and she really wanted to go to Toronto. Anna moved from math to, into journalism, in particular data journalism, because it, it was an application of her interest in data, math, web design, and public information, an area urgently needed, she said, as opposed to other uses of those disciplines. In fact, she has worked in Silicon Valley, but didn't find that to her liking. Anna has also taught uh, at the journalism school at the University of California, Berkeley. She has made presentations at the National Institute for Computer Assisted Reporting and at Visualize, an experiential information communication conference, as well as other conferences and symposia. She says, I always wanted to use what I love to do, math and art, to help myself and hopefully others better understand things that are important for us to understand. Her talk tonight is titled, Bloodless Numbers, Humanizing Data in Journalism. Please welcome Anna Flagg. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, is that, am I pronouncing that right? Paul? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, thanks everybody so much for having me. Um, I'm really happy to be here. So a few weeks ago, I read this article in the New York Times called Creativity Versus Quants. Um, it was an op-ed about the creative process, and in it the guy argues that data is sort of antithetical to creativity. He says that working with data is kind of a logical and determined process, and it has lots of precise calculations and rules to follow. So people who work with data 
don't really have that kind of like indefinable, messy, spontaneous creative genius that's really necessary for creative work. He calls numbers bloodless, um, which I think what he means by that is that they're lacking in humanity and kind of dehumanizing. And he says, creative work is never the result of the use of data. I'm gonna quote from the article. An original work, an aha product, or a fresh insight is rarely the result of precise calculation at one end, producing genius at the other. So as a data journalist who tries to make creative work using data, when I read that, I was like, wait a minute. Did I just screw up my whole career? Because you know, it's not really that unreasonable of an opinion um, that data work can be uncreative and dehumanizing, especially the dehumanizing part, right? The creativity part, I think there's a lot of examples of creative uses of data that we can easily find, but I think it is a legitimate criticism that um, data is often used in dehumanizing ways. And data journalism specifically, which is what I do, is heavy on the visualization of data and its presentation to the public. And that in particular can be dehumanizing. Because say the subject of some data set is a person. Most of the time that person ends up looking something like this, like a dot on the screen or a line in a bar chart, something like that. Now, that's really different from what a person actually is, right? There's this huge separation between the subject of the data and what the audience is seeing. So almost by definition, that sort of representation of one thing with another more abstract thing kind of makes data journalism distancing and dehumanizing. So does that mean that representation always has to be dehumanizing? I wanna give you an example, and this example is about tigers. Now, tigers have stripes, right? And that uh, helps them camouflage themselves as they um, hunt their prey, and, um, and that's kind of all that I thought that the stripes were about, right? It's about um, hiding, it's about like putting on a costume or a disguise to fool the prey um, so that you can hide from them. But it turns out, if you shave off a tiger's fur, which I don't think is a great idea, by the way, um, their skin is striped too. I did not know that. Um, and I think this is so cool for a couple of reasons. First of all, apparently every tiger has this unique pattern of stripes um, that is personal to that specific tiger. And the stripes on the fur are an exact representation of the stripes on the tiger itself. So it's unique and it's accurate and it's personal to every individual tiger. So today, I wanna to talk about how we can use data and represent data in creative ways to be just as accurate and in particular, just as close to its subjects as the tiger stripes are. This is all gonna be in the context of journalism um, and I hope that's okay. I think what I'm talking about can also be of interest to anybody outside of journalism who works with data about people or data that affects people. Okay, so we see a lot of great um, analytical uses of data, but less examples that focus on creating empathy or a human connection to its subject. Especially when you compare data to fields like writing or film or music. So why is that? Why is data humanizing sometimes, but sometimes not humanizing? One sort of obvious answer is, data has a lot of kind of natural affordances for counting and summing and aggregating and smoothing things out. And that's often the reason that people choose to work with data because they wanna do those things and they wanna use those things to figure out insights. Um, but all those operations involve seeing patterns at a high level. And although that's very valuable and often very necessary, by definition, it kind of does separate you from the individual subjects of your data. And I think there's another reason too, and that's just that it's a lot harder to use data in a humanizing way. Often when you're working with data that involves people, at least in journalism, your topic tends to be frequently quite dark. And if you're gonna try to connect your audience to that, then you're gonna have to kind of get into it yourself. And it's also frequently not very clear how to go about creating a connection between your audience and your subject. It's a lot easier to stick to describing a more analytical part of the story, which you can do quite successfully from a safe distance. Um, but I'm a big believer that before you can do anything really good, it's important to get very depressed first, and I'm gonna talk about some people that I think uh, really did do that. They got very depressed, and they got really into it, and they did all that extra hard work to connect with the underlying uh, humanity of their data, and to create something that allows the audience to connect to it too. 
For me, all these people have shown that creative use of data can not only avoid dehumanizing its subjects, but it can also actively humanize them um, in its own particular way, taking advantage of the properties and the power that are unique to data itself. Because data is just a tool like any other tool, and there are opportunities to take advantage of the humanizing power of data at every stage in the process. So I'm gonna to try to cover um, each of these major stages that I think are important. So data collection, when we're collecting data, when we're analyzing data, when we're presenting the data, and when we're delivering it to the audience. From my point of view, the first two parts of this process, data collection and analysis of the data, are kind of more on the analytical side and they determine what it is that your audience sees. The second two steps, design and delivery, are more emotional parts which determines kind of how someone feels when they're looking at your data. Okay, first up, what data you decide to collect really matters because this is fundamentally a choice about what to look at. Now, most data helps you see something, but the examples that I'm gonna talk about here are all highlighting something that is either very hard to see, or it's inaccessible for some reason, or we didn't know it was there, or it's almost not even really there in a certain way. Um, but I'm gonna make that more concrete with an example. So, the Washington Post started a database of people shot dead by police starting in 2015. The Guardian also maintains a similar database, and the Chicago Tribune just published one for police shootings in Chicago between 2011 and 2015. So you might ask, why are news organizations doing this? Why can't they just get that data from the US government? Well, it turns out the FBI doesn't actually collect that data. And I think most people would agree that collecting and making a record of people killed by police is a very important thing to do, and it seems almost inconceivable that no such record exists before 2015. Collecting this data is saying something, right? It's saying, this thing happened. We counted it, you count, you matter. And I think that's really powerful and it's kind of a unique capability that data has. Because first of all, you know, we need to acknowledge that we live in a time where so many people get killed by police that not every one of them is gonna get their even 15 minutes of national attention, right? And even if they are one of the ones that gets that attention, that attention will eventually die down. Days pass, other things happen, um, and even though some people will continue to remember and continue to talk about it, the national conversation is inevitably gonna move on. Maybe it'll come back when another similar thing happens, but you really don't know. The Guardian, the Washington Post, and the Chicago Tribune by making a record of what happened, that's this permanent thing in a secure database. Um, and for the foreseeable future, as long as the internet exists, that piece of data is gonna be there. That piece of data is not gonna move on, it's not gonna get distracted when something else happens, it's not gonna forget. It's a record and it's an acknowledgement, and I think that's a particular humanizing power of data. Next, I wanna talk about a project by data artist Josh Begley. It's called Prism Map. So I work at the Marshall Project and our focus is on those affected by the criminal justice system. Now, this is an enormous group of people. If you think about everyone who's in prison or jail now or everyone who was in prison or jail last year or sometime in the last 10 or 20 years. We're talking about millions of people and, and currently there are 2.2 million in prison. And the incarceration, uh, incarcerated population is in some ways invisible, right? I mean, what is a prison? A prison is a way, a place that we can put someone where they're isolated from everybody else and away from society where we can't really see them anymore. They're sort of collectively forgotten. And that's why I think this project by Josh Begley is really interesting and in particular, it's a humanizing use of data. So let me show you what I mean. Um, these are satellite photos of every prison in the US. There's around 5,000 of them. And taken together, they show this kind of massive amount of space where people are put away to be invisible. This is a different way of understanding this idea than, for instance, the stat that 2.2 million people are incarcerated that I mentioned before. I think it's a creative and in certain ways uh, interesting and humanizing way to understand this number because even though you aren't seeing any of these people's faces, all of a sudden you aren't thinking about that number 2.2 million and wondering, okay, 2.2 million, that's a lot of people, but how big is it? What can I compare it to? How can I understand this huge number? 
Instead, you're sort of thinking about their physical presence in these huge swaths of land in the US that's devoted to incarceration. And you're thinking about this huge amount of physical space that it requires to house these people um, who are usually kind of invisible to us when we're on the outside. Um, and it might make you think a little bit about what it's like to be in there. So um, I hesitated to, yeah, I'm gonna apologize ahead of time for including this next example because um, as dark as a lot of these projects are, this one is probably the most explicit, um, but I did want to include it. This is the Auschwitz Museum in Poland. It's a museum devoted to remembering the people killed in the Auschwitz concentration camps. And there's an exhibit here with this kind of huge glass display that's filled with the hair that was cut off people when they were entered into the camp. So I guess, I, I didn't know this, but they, they cut the hair to be used in making uniforms and upholstery products um, and in a an, uh, kind of attempt to prevent typhus, which spreads through lice. Um, this is the hair of an estimated 140,000 people. Now, I think when you see this, more than anything else, um, it's just like a feeling, like a very dark feeling. The data aspect of it, that 140,000 number that I mentioned, or maybe the exact kind of volume of this that you might perceive, that part of it kind of recedes into, into the background. And I bet if this room had twice as much hair in it or half as much hair in it, how you would understand it and how you would feel would probably be the same. Um, this is a situation where it's so kind of tragically effective that you don't even think of it as data anymore. Okay, uh, next I wanna talk about a, a bit of a nicer project called Rocky Beginnings. This is a part of a series, Quantified Selfie, by Lam Tuivo. And it tells a story of a woman named Stephanie and her move from San Francisco to New York City through the songs that she listened to in her first year there. So each dot here represents a song that she played frequently and it's colored by how she feels about the song. So if it's blue, she associates it with sadness. If it's pink, it makes her happy. Yellow means she has um, mixed, complicated feelings about it. And this kind of tells a story about the initial loneliness that you feel when you move to a new city. Because um, if you see at the beginning, when it starts out, there are a lot more sad blue songs in the beginning. California, Joni Mitchell, come back from San Francisco, the magnetic fields, she's, she's, um, she's kind of missing home already. But then as time goes on, the music gets more and more pink as she learns to like New York City. And for her, this whole situation was complicated further because after she moved, she went through a breakup. The songs get really negative around this time. So we have Since You've Been Gone, Kelly Clarkson, Break Your Heart Right Back, Ariana Grande, Best Thing I Never Had, Beyonce, Bad Blood, Taylor Swift, that's a classic one. Then, as she gradually gets over the breakup, you see more kind of happy, upbeat music, a lot of like good riddance Taylor Swift songs. Taylor Swift, Shake It Off, On to the Next One, Jay-Z, Started from the Bottom, Drake, Problem, Ariana Grande, Taylor Swift, Welcome to New York, Taylor Swift, We Are Never, Ever, Ever Getting Back Together. Taylor Swift is really good for breakup, the bad parts and the good parts, so remember that. Um, yeah, so this is a sort of different way of representing a person, right? It's a different way of knowing her. I don't know what Stephanie looks like. I don't know how old she is or her job or what she's like to have coffee with. Instead, I see this kind of very emotional and personal side of her that is her taste in music. Um, and in particular, how music interacts with her mood and how she gets energy or consolation from music in the same way that I do and I'm sure lots of other people do. That's humanizing in a way that might not even be possible through meeting her unless you knew her for a very long time. Okay, so the last project in this section that I wanna talk about is The Driving Life and Death of Philando Castile, which is a story by NPR. It visualizes almost a decade and a half of Castile's traffic stops, which began before his 19th birthday, when he still had his learner's permit, and led to what seems like an endless cycle of further traffic stops, fines, late fees, court appearances, and license revocations. The choice, I think, to focus on this data is humanizing in a way um, that's different from standard approaches that people use to try to make a subject real and relatable to the reader. So, for instance, this is not a photo of him. It's nothing about what he looks like, or his family, or his relationships, or his personality, or his community. What it is, is a graphic presentation of what it was like to be him 
re with regards to this one very specific aspect of his life. And when you see this, I think it communicates um, in a more powerful way than if you say read in text something like, oh, he was stopped X number of times in the span of 10 years, or a oh, quote from the family talking about how he kept getting stopped. Because what you're seeing is the actual timeline, which is very convincing, right? And you're seeing how nearly constant the stops and fines were. And on a very gut level, you're getting this kind of feeling like, wow, this was a very a constant part of his life. Um, and I think that data here is really necessary to give you that kind of gut level context. And it's almost as if you, you can kind of see what it's like to be him in a very like kind of small, limited way. Okay, next I wanna uh, talk a little bit about what happens after you have some data, how you analyze it, and what questions you might ask of it, and how you investigate those questions. This first example is a couple years old, so you might have already seen it discussed a lot, um, but I wanna talk about it particularly in terms of how it represents people. So if you haven't seen this, each arc on here represents someone who was killed by a gun in 2013. The whole arc length represents the sort of predicted lifespan of the person if that person had not been killed. So using a model to predict age at which people die due to natural causes, it shows in orange the number of years um, that this person actually lived, and then in gray you see the age that they kind of are predicted to might have lived to. Um, and I just think that's really interesting because what we're seeing here is this measure of lost potential. It helps, uh, it helps you think about who this person might have been and who they might have become if they had been given that extra time. And I think that helps make each one of these um, more of a person to you rather than a statistic. This project is also interesting because it shows us both the near view and the far view of the data. Data is usually pretty good at showing you the kind of zoomed out view, which is you know, total numbers and aggregates and high level patterns. Here, they do that with these big numbers, you know, over 11,000 people killed, and what they calculate to be about half a million uh, lost years. But they're also showing each individual as a person with his or her own arc of lost years. Now, these people are using the exact same UCR crime data that everybody else uses, whoever analyzes um, gun deaths. But here, they did this very creative analysis to put this in terms of lost potential. So I think this is a really um, kind of interesting and humanizing analysis. This is a project by the New York Times called Money, Race, and Success. It plots kids' school achievement quantified by grade point average against the socioeconomic status of their parents. So as you can see, there's a pretty strong linear relationship here. The more wealthy your parents are, the better you do in school. Further down, there is an even more detailed breakdown by race, where you see that white students are consistently able to outperform their black and Hispanic peers with the greatest disparities when the socioeconomic gaps are the highest. Now, the kids here are being represented by a dot, and furthermore, each dot is actually representing a large group of people. So you're quite separated from the subjects of this data, right? You're separated from each group of people by the visual representation, and then the dot is further represented from the individuals by their being aggregated. But this project started with a question about how equal the playing field is in America. We're all supposed to be able to achieve the American dream if we work hard, but is that true? And how do we check something that seems so hard to quantify? The New York Times does this by asking this more quantifiable question, which is, does your parents' wealth affect your ability to succeed? What they're actually asking is, can we all achieve the American dream? And I think that's fundamentally an empathetic question. So the choice to perform this particular analysis and look for whether this relationship exists is, I think, a humanizing analysis. And if you're in a group where your family generally succeeds in school, it sort of helps you see how the other half lives. This next project is about the Syrian refugee crisis. So, We've all heard reporting of the huge numbers of Syrians who have been affected. Six million internally displaced and almost five million more refugees outside of Syria. This is another example of an obviously very large number, um, but it's kind of hard to grasp how really large it is, right? I mean, I know that's a ton of people, but I don't have much of a sense of the scale. 
And such a big number is obviously very removed from any sense of the people themselves. So this Washington Post analysis puts the number in different terms to help humanize its subject. So when you scroll down, uh, depending on how long you've been on the page, they show you how many people were estimated to have left Syria in that span of time. So now you're understanding this in an entirely different way, right? Um, I'm seeing this, I'm thinking, okay, so in this short amount of time that I've been on the page, 12 people have left Syria. To me, that's a much more effective and relatable way to try to understand this huge number. So creative analysis humanizes data here, but so does the design. If you, um, if you see the kind of moving figures here, they're um, much more personable and individual than a standard like person, a person icon. They're not anonymous at all. Some run, some walk with children, some walk slowly with a cane. We aren't seeing photographs of real refugees, but it's almost more powerful this way in some sense because we can kind of recognize ourselves in these figures and we can see our friends and our family. Okay, so that was my last example in the analysis part, but it also showed um, a little bit about how design can help humanize data. And so I wanna talk some more about that. This is a project by Amnesty International that is a 3D virtual reality view of a military prison in Syria. They uh, follow stories of individuals and it shows you what the experience is like as you move through the facility. It's interactive so you can kind of pan around yourself to see the space, you can see how small it is and how crowded it is. Um, sometimes virtual reality can look a little gimmicky but this one here I think is really effective and I, I mean, I don't know if anyone here has seen this or tried it, but if you're interested, um, I would definitely suggest trying it out because as you use it, the longer you use it, you really honestly start feeling more and more anxious. And especially when you get into the kind of really small cells where it's just you and two other people in this like, you know, four by two kind of space, you, you kind of get nauseous and you, you feel kind of downright panicky. And that's a pretty big accomplishment for a website. I mean, as a designer, whenever I make something, um, I'm pretty much hoping that people don't want to throw up when they use it. Like, that's my number one goal. But here, they're trying to do the opposite. They're trying to communicate to you the feeling of what it's like to be in this space. And I think it's really effective at doing that. Um, and it's even more impressive when you find out that the whole thing is actually built out of people's memories, not even existing data. They didn't have the actual architectural plans for this facility, so they had to build the whole thing up from scratch, um, kind of like a sketch artist would. Okay, this next project is a data visualization by the New York Times of the 200,000 people who have been killed um, up to the day of its publish in the Syrian Civil War. So if you see here, they've represented each person with a dot, and as you scroll down, you can kind of see all 200,000 of them. Now this visualization does involve representing people with dots, which as I mentioned earlier, definitely kind of abstracts away um, a lot of the human element. But they did a few things here with the design to counter that. First, rather than using each dot to represent an aggregated group of people, which they could have done in order to make the whole data visualization fit on one page. Um, but instead what they're doing is representing each individual person with one dot. And then the fact that these dots are so tiny and there's so many of them that you need to scroll that much in order to even see them all, that really helps communicate how really big this number is. And I think it's kind of easier to comprehend that 200,000 number when it's literally spelled out for you like that. The other thing they did was rather than place all the dots in kind of strict rows and columns that all line up, they made the whole thing the whole like layout more humanistic, kind of this like big non-uniform mass, which is kind of like what you might see if you were looking down at a big group of people from above. And that kind of very small touch of randomness and non-uniformity gives it a bit more of a human feel and uh, kind of helps you see these dots more as actual people. This next example is a project about domestic violence um, from 538. And um, I think it does some really interesting things with design to both humanize its subjects and to communicate the data. So it gives you this stat that 10 women were killed by intimate partners with a gun in Oregon in 2013. 
Now, a standard way of communicating this number would either be just citing the number itself, or if you went the other way, um, showing pictures of each one of the people involved. This does something in the middle that I think captures some of the strengths of both. Instead of photos, it used these kind of um, beautiful and really emotive illustrative portraits. The illustrations here preserve the anonymity of the women, but also are each kind of different from each other and have their own individuality and their own kind of feeling. And similar to the Washington Post story from earlier about the Syrian refugees, this kind of vague but personable illustrative style allows us to recognize women that we know in them um, or ourselves. And then I want to say one other thing about the choice to use illustrations here. So probably the most frequent approach that journalists take to humanize their subjects is photographs of them. But when it's a case like this, when we're talking about people who have been killed, I wonder, um, I sometimes personally just wonder whether there aren't alternatives because I sort of think about if it were me, would I want to be represented after my death by a photo of myself that I didn't even choose? Um, it almost feels like one photo would be maybe both too shallow and too specific to capture a person, and maybe something would, uh, with less definition would actually be better. Um, so that's, that's just a thought that I have and something that I think they touched on a little bit here. It's a pretty tough question. So The Next to Die is a project by my colleagues at the Marshall Project that tracks executions in the US. It might be surprising to think about, and it certainly was surprising to me when I found out, um, but it's not always very well known when someone who has been sentenced to death is actually executed. And I think that's pretty strange, given that it's the most drastic form of punishment that um, can be taken against an individual person. So it shouldn't be done in secret, and this project tracks and publishes when it happens. Now, this is a pretty challenging task in terms of humanizing the subjects uh, for two reasons. First of all, um, it's not really the Marshall Project's place to tell you whether capital punishment is right or wrong. That's up to you to form your own opinion based on your own knowledge and experience. Um, also, the kind of second issue here is that in this data set, you're attempting to humanize people who have done or at least have been found guilty of some very inhumane things. So the goal here is, without suggesting either way whether capital punishment is right or wrong, and without commenting on the guilt of the subject, to just kind of communicate really simply that this is a person, a, a human being who's being put to death. And there's one kind of little part of this design that I think gets, that, uh, gets at that in a really clever way. So, it's, it's really small, so it might be hard to see, but when you move your mouse kind of back and forth over this figure, his shadow moves around with you. And you know, this is a tiny thing, and, and I don't even know how many people necessary, necessarily notice it, um, but to me, it seems like it helps you make a little bit of a connection with the fact that this is a person. And even though they are, in all other respects, a pretty anonymous figure to you, no photo or anything like that, um, but the shadow moving around like this helps you, for a moment, occupy the same space as him. And it's kind of like you're just in there with him in a very you know, small, limited way. So this is a project I did for ProPublica. Um, I'm only going to show one of my projects because there are a lot of other projects out there that are really good that are not done by me. So I'm just going to show this one. This is not exactly humanizing because it's about animals, but it's the same idea. It's taking IUCN data of all known species and whether or not they are vulnerable for extinction. It's based on the fact that 30 to 50% of species are predicted to go extinct sometime in the next century. You know, we're really in the middle of a pretty massive extinction event right now. So the goal is to sort of show some context for that. But the part of it that I want to show you is how we tried to make the project a little more personal and connect it to you a little bit. So this is the homepage, and it explains that a really huge number of species are likely to go away quite soon. So when you scroll, this kind of sad little turtle just walks away and out of your life forever. And that's because 80% of turtle species are likely to go extinct in the next century. Anyway, I didn't want to make it too sad, so if you scroll back up, it'll just come right back up. It's too bad we can't do that in real life. 
We also broke the data down into categories, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and birds, and here's the mammal section. So this is what looks like a, lion, uh, a photo of a lion here, but when you hover over her, she moves around. And the point of that was to sort of make it a little bit more real to the viewer. Okay, my last section is about how data is delivered to audiences and where, it how, where and how it meets them in their lives. So Usher and Nas collaborated on a song called Chains and everybody wanted to listen to it so they put it up online on a site called Don't Look Away. So when you get to this site, using facial recognition, it locates your head and your eyes. Then you're allowed to start, so th this is me using it, and after it locates your face, it will start playing the song. So as you listen, it shows you photos of victims of police and racial violence. And it kind of watches you watch the video. And if you turn your head away, the song is going to stop playing. So to make the song start again, you have to turn back and look at the photos. So right here, I looked away at this moment. So it stopped the song and prompted me to come back and look again. And I think this is really interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, by forcing us to look these victims of violence in the eyes, it's obviously confronting us with their humanity and with the reality of what happened to them. Um, and the fact that it has to be forced in this way exposes a whole other idea as well, which is showing that um, sometimes these tragedies are so painful that people don't even want to see them. You know, like they don't, they don't necessarily want to humanize these victims. Um, Another interesting part of how the images are delivered to you is that before you start the video, when you're, in, when you're kind of calibrating the webcam to your face, you're looking at your own face in the same space. And then a few moments later, you see the victim's face in a similar size, the exact same place, looking just like you, like looking right back at you. Okay, the last example I wanna talk about is another project by Josh Begley called Metadata Plus. This is an iPhone app that tracks US drone strikes and sends you a notification to your phone when it happens, describing whatever is known about the strikes and the victims. The reason this app is called Metadata is that actually very little data is known about drone strikes. What we have is just a brief description of what you might think should be a much kind of bigger, more detailed data set. It's almost data about data, so it's metadata. And this app does something really unusual with that, which is sort of encroach on this very personal space of your phone, which is something that you're really close to and you always have with you. So that notification space is usually reserved for messages from your friends or family or updates from your social networks. Um, so having it interrupt you there with a notification about a drone strike is really jarring and sobering. And I think it's necessary when we're talking about the drone war because us on the outside of it don't really hear that much reporting on it and we're pretty distanced from it. So this project kind of helps um, make the drone war more real to people outside of it and bring it closer into our everyday lives. Okay, so that was kind of my spiel. Um, I just wanna leave you with the final thought that data is just a tool like any other tool and it can be used however you want. Um, at every stage in the process of working with data, you have the opportunity to humanize your subjects and to put people first. And I hope it's something that people will continue to think about and continue to make really creative and beautiful work to do. Um, yeah, so that's all I have. Thanks for having me. Oh, and thanks also, um, I know you guys have a link to this event and there's a photo of Edward Snowden right before me. So I sent that link to my parents and I told them I was on a panel with Edward Snowden. And they definitely, they definitely kind of believe me, so. All right, thanks. <laughs> Uh, if you have questions, uh, raise your hand. I'll come give you a mic. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, oh, my God. That is so loud. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, uh, do you know why the metadata app is not available in the US? I think that Apple took it out of the App Store. Um, I think, I'm trying to remember what the word was that they used. 
I'm, I'm blanking on it, but it was, I think they called it offensive. So it's gone. <laughs> Can you, can you talk a bit about, I don't know, maybe this is a dry technical question, but um, some of the work that you have to do in, in programming to get those really interesting effects, like the shadow that moves and the, and the you know, it, there seems like there's got to be a lot going, under the, going on behind the scenes for even some of these very minimal um, kinds of presentations. Can you talk a little bit about um, how much work there is on that aspect? Yeah, so, um so I, I didn't work on that uh, on the Next to Die project, but I know um, the guy who did make that shadow, and it's it's kind of a I think he well I don't want to get too technical, but it's like a WebGL thing where you basically set up a 3D environment and it's like you're moving a light bulb around him when you move around. Um, but yeah, I mean it takes I think the the design aspect of it definitely takes a huge amount of time, and it's not just coming up with an idea that you think is going to communicate your data, but it's also testing it and making sure people understand it and then other people interpret it in the way that you intend. Um, but it's also, you know, it's like the fun part after, you know, it's, it's definitely like the terrible part is the cleaning of the data. And once you do that part, then, you know, then you can kind of move on. Hi, um, when you are writing a piece, how often will you collaborate with somebody else? Because I know that a lot of the technical work of statistics is hard, but a lot of the analysis often takes a lot of, I don't know, knowledge about politics or sociology or whatever the particular subject is. Yeah, I collaborate all the time. Um, and I think that, well, so there are certain newsrooms that make this really strong difference between a kind of, well, what they would call a traditional journalist or someone who focuses on writing, and then somebody who, you know, does digital stuff or works with data, and they try to kind of separate these things to make a, a workflow. So the journalist finds a story and writes it up, and then they send it to this person, and they tell them, I want a chart, and this person makes a chart. I think that's, like, the worst way of doing anything, because what you want to do is both use, is use both of your skills to make the best thing possible. And in the end, I don't really think that a data journalist is different than a regular journalist. I mean, we're all journalists because we're all interested in information, and journalists have always worked with data. It's not like data journalism is a new thing that you know only we can do or something like that. Um, yeah, so I think uh, I really, myself, really, just for selfish reasons, really enjoy working with journalists because I learn things that way. Um, and I think it, yeah, you come up with like much, much better work that way. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. Um, so my question is about, so intellectually, um, like I would like, like if I trust a data, like I usually think of it as um, analysis through a disinterested uh, objective viewpoint. And through your work, it's more effective, like um, I feel emotional, but then intellectually I feel like I'm, it might introduce some sort of bias or um, so do you think there is there needs to be a trade-off or do you think they, they can be um, compromised or have a good like symbiosis yeah yeah I mean I think that's a really good question um, and I think it's something that you know we run into anytime you make any piece of journalism so if somebody writes something the way they write it really affects how how you feel when you read it. And maybe it's a little bit more kind of in your face if it's a visual presentation, but you know, you always have to think about, okay, what am I really trying to say? And am I putting too much of my own bias into this? And I think that's something that the journalists always struggle with. And I don't know if data is any better, like there's definitely the perception that data is unbiased, but it's definitely not. You know, it has the same biases that that any, any kind of story can have. Um, have you ever seen stories get, uh, if especially in that structure of you have the non-data journalists who write a piece, they send it over to the, uh, 
data journalists, will a piece ever get shut down because they're, because they're like, okay, you made a claim and then the data just does not support the claim, so we're not gonna run this story. Right. Um, well, I don't think that's ever happened to me, but I can definitely see it happening. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm sure it does, it does sometimes happen in places where there's not enough collaboration. And I mean, that happens all the time. When you're working on a project, you think you know what the story is, but the more time you spend working on it, you realize that what you thought about, you know, what you thought in the beginning is completely off base, and now your story is a completely different thing. So, yeah, I, I mean, I could definitely see that happening. Anna, um, thank you very much for being here, and thank you very much for working on the Marshall Project, which uh, I don't think you got much of a chance to talk about exactly, but it is, uh, the whole point of it is, it's named for Thurgood Marshall, and the whole point of it is to reach some kind of fairness in our criminal justice system. So thank you for working on that. Um, I had the advantage of uh, talking to you at dinner, and, and so one of the things I find interesting is that in the United States, I think many of us now understand, um, white middle class Americans now understand that we've got this disproportionate number of African American young men who are in prisons, it's grossly disproportionate to their population. But I think uh, one of the things that's interesting is that the Southern Law Poverty Center has been tracking this in the South for decades. And so my question to you is that what we need more data about is perhaps the quote unquote northern states because as we talk about this problem, we don't really have a sense of what's happening, happening in northern and western states where we actually kind of maybe have a better record of what's happening in the South. What do you think about that? I don't know. I mean, it sounds reasonable. Um, I, I know that personally from my own experience working at the Marshall Project, um, we don't have enough data about almost anything. So if, if it's, you know, it might be true that we're lacking data more in the North, I'm, I'm really not sure about that. Um, but the criminal justice system is extremely opaque and it's, uh, you know, both in terms of the fact that there's not much data out there and it's really hard to get that data and also just in terms of understanding it. Like it's, there a lot, it's a very complicated system and, you know, it, every state is like its own country and it has its own rules and it, you have to kind of get the intricacies of each one of those before you can really understand what's going on. Um, so I think we need more data everywhere. Um, hi, I just had a quick question. What are some of your tools for data collection and some of the challenges to collecting data? Okay, um, for, for collection or for like analysis or the whole thing? Collection. Collection, okay. Um, well, I'm like when I'm trying to get data, I'm always just emailing people asking them to give it to me. I don't really have very good tools for actually collecting data, because usually the kind of data that I'm working for, I need to get it from a police department or a sheriff's office or something like that. So, I mean, in terms of collecting data in a more general sense, it's not about the criminal justice system. There are, there are a lot of publicly available data sets. So, like, honestly, you just need to, like, spend a lot of time Googling. Like, you have, you have a question, um, you just Google it a lot, and then you reach out to everybody. If you don't find what you're looking for, you reach out to everybody who's, like, even tangentially involved in the area and you ask them, does this data exist? If it doesn't, how else can I answer my question? Like that, that's how I approach anything. I talk to somebody who knows more than me and I tell them, okay, this is what I'm trying to do. And um, I explain to them what my problem is and then I just hope that they're gonna help me. Do you ever run into any issues where you're facing cases of defamation or sedition at all? And if you were, God forbid, to get something wrong or if you got something right and somebody was, didn't want it to be right, do you, have you ever come across that, at least maybe in the Marshall Project or more extensively? Um, so I personally have not had that experience yet, but I know that so for instance, one project that we're working on at the Marshall Project right now, we're trying to get information that we believe 
is um, public and that we're entitled to, but the people that we're trying to get it from don't share that opinion, and they're actually kind of threatening us with litigation. So we're, we're threatening them because we're like, we're gonna sue you if you don't give us this data, and then they're coming back with their lawyers, so this definitely happens. Um, yeah, so I, I, I mean, I don't really know how to deal with it. <laughs> Thank you for the case study. Some beautiful visualizations there. Uh, quick one, could you walk us through the brainstorm process and how in the testing that you mentioned as well, are you um, looking for understanding from end users or how, how does that look like? So the, um, the, the testing process or brainstorming for an idea for a story? Okay, okay. so everything, okay. <laughs> um, Okay, well, I, it always starts with a question. You have some question that you want to answer and you don't know the answer, and so you start looking for data to answer that question. And then maybe you don't find exactly what you're looking for, and instead you find something that's like kind of related and might get at it. So you download that data, you look at it, you're confused by it, you interview people who are experts in it, and you ask them what they think, you explain what you're trying to do to them. And then hopefully after this whole, I mean, I mean, it's basically just reporting. So you do this whole initial reporting process on the, on the data. Um, and then once you think you have an understanding as to what it is that your data means and what story you're able to tell with it, um, then you kind of, you get into design. And so, I mean, so I don't know if you wanted to know about tools, but um, the tools that I use, I use R or Python um, when I'm kind of initially investigating the data and trying to figure out what it means. Um, and then I use things like uh, Illustrator and D3.js and other kind of visualization libraries to try to like make quick graphs showing, you know, what do things look like? Does this show the thing that I'm trying to show? Um, yeah, and then you kind of, you do a design process that's, that's similar to the kind of design process that that goes into product design, I guess, um, because you, you make something, you show it to people, you see if they understand it, um, and then you kind of iterate yourself on it over and over, and then once you think you're good, then you'll go do user tests. You'll show it to a stranger, you'll make sure that they know how to use it. If they are able to use it without being confused, and if they're able to, answer, like you ask them questions and you're like, okay, did you get this? Or you ask them to explain it to you, and if they explain to you the thing that you were hoping to communicate, then you're ready to go. Thank, thank you. Um, as teachers at Ohio Wesleyan, we are involved uh, in the um, discovery of knowledge, the description of knowledge, the transmission of knowledge. But this in, this, in this particular election cycle, um, uh, knowledge, data, facts, seem to be of, of limited value. So that's my question. Can you say a few things about that? Do we live in a post-fact age now where <laughs> people don't think anymore but you know, simply react with their gut feelings? Or you know, is, have we reached a, a, the end of, 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 of data? I hope not. You know, as a teacher, you know, I, would be, I guess we would be out of a job. But I'm very concerned you know, about what I see nationwide. People can say anything, any lie. You know, they can exaggerate, you know, and they get away with it, with impunity. Um, so. <laughs> well, I mean, if I knew the answer to that question, then I'd probably be president. I mean. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, I do not believe that we live in a post-fact world. Um, I think that some of us do, and I'm not naming any names, but the rest of us, I think, still care about facts and earth. I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, that's that's a extremely difficult question. <laughs> Let me, let me re-ask Tom's question in a slightly different way. Do you think that the stuff that you're doing and the visualization stuff that you're making will help this kind of unfactualness? You know what I mean? That I guess I'm of the opinion that politicians are bad at explaining stuff, and if you want to get into details, people fall asleep. But maybe this kind of stuff will be better at getting it across. Yeah, um, I think that it is possible sometimes, because a lot of what we do is trying to simplify things 
So, you know, maybe somebody gets into a lot of details about policy that the vast majority of people are going to be too busy to pay attention to. So, if we can take that and kind of distill it into a like really small thing that is easily shareable and easily understandable, then it might spark people's interest a little bit to themselves go and investigate further. I, I think that might help a little bit. Um, when you were showing the graph about uh, the projected years that were lost from the, the shootings, uh, I'm kind of curious how they were managed to project all of the years across like, what was it, like 11,000 some people? Yeah, so I think they um, built, they just built a model that was based on kind of natural causes death information from the overall population. So they would just uh, kind of, we have distributions over like age at which people will die and what the causes are. Like heart disease is a big cause of, uh, like natural cause of death. Um, and they use that model to try to kind of predict, you know, how long this person might have lived. I mean, I, so I, I didn't do that analysis myself, but I, I think that's you know how they did it. Well, let's thank Anna again. <laughs>